sport creates that audacity. Like sport is just the process of failing and failing and failing and just trying, you know, like you have to be comfortable with failing and learning from it and, and trying again and trying harder and picking yourself back up. I do see a lot of parallels between sport and business. I mean, you know, the high-impact athletes is a non-profit, but it's, it's a business just without the profit. Um, and there are a lot of failures the same way that in tennis, you know, almost every week of the year I would lose. Like people, people don't win many tournaments per year. And I think one thing that sport is really good for is creating that resilience and that ability to take failure and learn from it and try again. Yeah, that's, that's probably been the most valuable mindset for me in this. People want to know that we are life. real people, you know? <laughs> yeah, like they want to see the life. They want to see the behind the scenes. So if you have to let your dog out, mate, then you go ahead. Okay. What's your dog's name, by the way? Loki. Lucky? Loki, like the god of mischief. Oh, Loki. And oh, the god of he's, uh, <laughs> He lives up to Living it. Living up to his name? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, Marcus, hit us with the uh, one, two, three action, set the scene, and we'll be ready to rock. One, two, three. Action. Boom. So much better than the first time we Breakfast. tried this. But well, that's all good. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to another Cool Down Conversations. Today, I am joined by Marcus Daniel. Marcus is a former Olympian and a professional tennis player. He's also the CEO and founder of High Impact Athletes. Marcus, thanks so much for joining. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. It's uh, It's good to be here chatting with you. Yeah. So a little bit of background for, for those that are listening is this is probably, I think, our fourth or fifth attempt at this episode. And the last time that it fell through, we said, maybe it's just not meant to be. But usually when you get that much resistance around something, it's a sign to push through and make it happen. So we're here pushing through, make it happen. Hopefully it was worth it. Hopefully we don't get to the end of this. It's like, well, we should have just given up after the first time. Um, but I appreciate you sticking with me, Marcus, and, and giving me the time of day. No worries. Ho hopefully we don't get to the end of this in the recording or it's, somehow it's lost. I think that might, yeah, that might be our final sign, but we're here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll give it one more shot. So uh, thanks again for, for tuning in. Now, uh, you're, you're chiming in from New Zealand. How's everything over there? It's beautiful. It's a bit cold. Uh, we're sort of in the thick of winter now. Uh, skiing season has started. So yeah, I'm looking out the window. I'm in a little town called Raglan, which is a little surf town on the west coast of the North Island. Mm -hmm. Beautiful water and, and mountains and it's a sunny day today. So can't, can't really complain. No, not at all. So we're on the opposite end of the spectrum in New York. We're obviously um, and get into the thick of, of summer, which I don't, I'm not going to complain about. So speaking of surfing, you had, uh, a bit of a, a mishap not too long ago, the last time we spoke. Yeah. So what I think happened was, you know, I've been playing tennis for a couple of decades. Uh, and I think I partially tore my meniscus at some point last year because I started having some knee pain, but then mm -hmm. a few months ago, um, I was just standing up on a wave. So, you know, going from a low crouch up to standing and my knee just completely gave out, like heard a bunch of pops and cracks and sharp pain and, and yeah, I collapsed and it was pretty badly torn. So hmm. I had surgery a couple of months ago now and have just got back on my feet. Uh, just, just ditched the crutches about a week ago and feeling amazing to, to be able to, you know, walk a little bit and carry things from room to room in the house. Um, so yeah, I'm on, I'm on the up. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, the, the, the things that we take for granted and I can see that the, you let the hair, the hair grow out a little bit too, since we last spoke. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. While, <laughs> while I've been recovering, I've been letting everything grow. <laughs> oh, nice. Everything. All right, cool. Too much. We can try and give it PG here. So <laughs> Marcus, um, you know, obviously 
we know of your background as a as a professional tennis player and now you know our goal is to to highlight what you're doing uh, with high impact athletes but give us a little bit of background into um you know your playing history and how it started in in, in your childhood and, and how you got to this point i'm i'm gonna take the uh the dog pee break because i think if i don't okay, do it so now, low key low key needs a pee that's fine it's I'll, like, I'll, like i said i want it to in, be raw all right in one minute i'll entertain i'll entertain everybody <laughs> So, so this is, this is going to be great entertainment. So while um, Marcus is letting low key out for a pee, which I don't blame him, um, I'm going to go ahead and just entertain, like I said. So um, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this one all alone. I didn't expect to be at this point, but I appreciate if you guys have stuck with me up until this point. Um, and again, like this is our fifth time trying this episode, so we're not going to let a little pee break get in the way of it so he's back that was quick okay i was expecting more live we're live do we do we have to let him back in too is that going to be like another possibly pause? in 10 minutes although it is a beautiful day and he's got a little bed in the sun outside so i think it i think he'll yeah. be okay it's not it's not oh, cool. super cold right, low-key yeah no i was just saying that um to myself i was pretty much just talking to myself but um <laughs> I was just saying that we tried this so many times that we said we're not going to let a little interruption for a pee break get in the way. So uh, we're good to go. But but back to the question, mate. So uh, just a bit of background on, on, you know, how you've gotten up to this point, um, you know, how you fell in love with tennis and, um, you know, things of that nature. Sure, yeah. So I, I had a tennis racket in my hand at a really young age. Uh, I grew up on a farm in New Zealand and there was this old concrete tennis court attached to the house my mum and dad used to used to play sort of in summer evenings uh after work and uh my brother and sister I'm, I'm the youngest of three my brother and sister wanted to join my parents and i wanted to join my brother and sister so from the age i could walk you know like around a year or or, or 15 months or whatever i was dragging a tennis racket around and my mum hung this it was quite, it was genius actually you know three three young kids she was trying to trying to distract us it, by any means necessary and for me it was putting a tennis ball in a tied up stocking and stringing it up from the top of the garage and i'd just stand there with this racket just like just batting this tennis ball around for hours from really young age so that was my introduction to tennis and I never really considered it, N neither I nor my family considered it as something serious until quite a bit later on, you know, it was just like one of the sports that I played alongside many others uh, in my childhood. And then when I was just before I turned 15, I was actually in the in the New Zealand squad for both tennis and, and soccer. And um, I had to choose between the two. Uh, had a little bit of pressure from the from the federation, so I ended up choosing tennis, and at that point decided I should probably be a bit more serious about it. Moved away from home up to a boarding school in Auckland, the biggest city in New Zealand, to to do some more training and sort of have, you know, a more consistent coaching and that sort of thing. Because to that point, I'd basically had sort of once a week coaching, um, and yeah, that was I guess that was the start of this journey towards becoming a professional and at 17 i moved over to slovakia to take the next step i uh, did my last year of school by correspondence and started playing professionally then struggled like crazy for many years the lower ranks of of professional tennis are brutal they're mm. incredibly competitive very poorly paid but very expensive and you know most years i was i was losing money you know i was like sharing beds and hotel rooms with other players so so to keep the costs down like that sort of thing mm -hmm. uh and then 2014 i started shifting a bit further towards doubles and by the end of that year my two rankings had split far enough that it just made sense to focus on doubles exclusively so from it was a good decision for me because from 2015 on while I was focusing purely on doubles I had much better results I could play bigger tournaments and I started actually making a living from tennis and you know like saving up a bit of money 
so yeah that that's sort of my journey through tennis and and the last mm. seven seven years i've been competing at the highest level uh, you know playing all the grand slams and all that sort of stuff and uh and yeah uh cut to now and and i was stuck overseas during covid uh new zealand had really strict border closures where even citizens couldn't get back for the main part um mm. so i i spent about 18 months straight on tour just sort of bouncing from hotel to hotel got extremely burnt out so needed to take a break and mm -hmm. that was i finally got back into the country february this year and then about six weeks later this knee injury happened and and that's effectively put me out for the for the rest of the year so yeah, in this in this sort of strange limbo state at the moment, but I'm really enjoying being in New Zealand and and haven't yet missed the rackets too much. Mm. Yeah, sometimes that um, unnecessary rest is necessary. You know, uh, we could always just keep going. Sometimes you get burnt out. It's interesting mm. to hear you talk about uh, your initial stages playing in the professional game because it's very similar to football or, or to soccer where. The lower leagues are so competitive because it's really the, the entry level and everyone wants to get in at that level and work their way up. Um, and you you end up spending more than you're making. It's just like you travel and you're, you know, you're putting yourself up, taking care of stuff. Um, what kept you motivated to keep going in those stages to, you know, obviously you didn't know you'd be at the point that you got to, or maybe you did, um, but maybe you couldn't see that at that, at that point. What kept you continue to say hey this is still what i want to do even though it's not ideal um what kept you on track i think i knew that i had the natural ability to do well mm -hmm. and injury has plagued me my my whole career uh so even in the early days you know when i was fighting to get up through the lower ranks i, I never played a full season i was always held back by something breaking uh, so it was always this tension of like, okay, I, I, I think I have the ability to break through and I'd sort of start moving up and then take one step back from injury. Mm. Uh, and it was, that was just the case for a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then actually, yeah, when I was 22 or 23, so I, I met a coach. Uh, uh, so, the, so the guy that we both know, David Samuel, I, I met him, mm -hmm. uh, I think when I was around 21 or 22. And when I, start, when I started working with him, I started making very rapid progress. And I started thinking, okay, like I can really do this. But again, injuries pulled me back and pulled me back. And then fast forward a couple of years to, to 2014, I was actually playing better singles than I ever had. And I was on a good path. Like my ranking was steadily moving upwards. I was playing better and better. And then I, yeah, I went on this strange run where I just won all the doubles matches. And because I won all the doubles matches, I couldn't compete in the qualifying of singles tournaments the weeks after. So mm -hmm. my rankings just sort of organically split apart. Um, but yeah, to, to get back to, to the, the heart of the question, I think what kept me going was seeing the people who were succeeding around me and, and believing that I had what they had and better. Mm. Um, and at, at the same time, so I had that sort of internal belief. And at the same time, I was very lucky because, you know, I had my parents who were helping me, um, mm -hmm. I had some, some private sponsors who were giving me a little bit of help, like without that support network, no way I could have continued. And that's wow. part of why I think tennis is such a brutal sport because unless you have a, unless you live in a country where there are a lot of tournaments, you can live at home and, and sort of drive around to them. Mm -hmm. Like if you're from New Zealand, you, you need to have a family that you, that can support you or like, a private sponsor who believes in you otherwise you're screwed like you just you just can't support the lifestyle so i was i was wow. very lucky in that respect as well yeah well it's profound to hear you say that because it's it's very interesting and i would like our listeners that are you know a lot of athletes to hear that it, there is not always as it's as not always as glamorous at first 
um, and that support system and network that you said that you tapped into was crucial in kind of bridging that gap, um, w w which was amazing to hear. So now you've had this this kind of reset. Obviously, the world kind of reset, and um, if and you said something when we did a pre call that you know if you weren't in the top one hundred and playing during you weren't playing during COVID, and if you weren't playing, you weren't getting paid um, type thing. So COVID kind of put you into a, a a rest period and then that led to you know what you're now truly really focused on in regards to high impact athletes so talk us through that transition yeah yeah so it's it started in 2020 so with with mm -hmm. the rise of covid uh the tour stopped my wife was working in the states so i made the t I, I was it was just after a davis cup tie in new zealand so i was in new zealand she was in the states I made the, um, what I always like to call insanely selfless and heroic decision to, uh, go over, go over to the States to be with her. And I'm still milking that for brownie points and will continue to do so for, for the rest of my life. Um, but I went over to the States to, to be with her cause I, it seemed at the time that if I didn't take that flight, I didn't know when we'd be able to see each other again. Mm -hmm. So anyway, went there and basically had nothing to do. Like, the the tour was off uh there was no training because at that stage it was like middle of winter in northern connecticut and um mm -hmm. her parents live in a tiny town there and we were sort of holed up like being really careful we didn't want to bring COVID into the house because her parents are, are a little older and so what it meant was for the first time in my adult life i'd been in one place for months and didn't have something that was just occupying 99% of my energy and, and most of my days. And mm -hmm. it allowed the space to think about my place in the world and sort of the legacy I wanted to leave or the impact I wanted to make. And like what you were saying earlier, if you're not in sort of the top 20 on the single side, you mm -hmm. don't have big endorsement deals that mean you get paid regardless of whether you're on court or not. Like if you're a doubles player, mm -hmm you get paid by winning tennis matches. So if you're not playing tennis matches, you're not earning. Um, so up to that point, I had, I had donated, I think at the start of that year, I'd committed 8% of my earnings to charity. Uh, but I didn't feel because I because I wasn't earning and because I didn't know when I would next earn, I didn't feel like I could up that. So when I was thinking about like, how much good can I do in the world? How can I do more as an individual? Donation was the first thing that came to my mind, but I didn't feel comfortable upping my donation for the year. So then the other thing that I realized was I could just be a much better advocate for this space, for the idea of giving and giving effectively. Mm -hmm. And that's what led to High Impact Athletes, uh, was <clears throat> this idea that I could speak to other athletes, speak to people in the sporting space about giving back, about why some charities are so much more impactful per dollar than others, why there are legitimate doubts about the charity space, but how there's a huge amount of research and evidence that goes into a small subset of charities where you can actually trust that your dollars are doing a huge amount of good. So that, that was what I started doing. I started uh, building this beacon or banner or, or this sort of movement that people could join, that athletes could join mm. to, to try and start using their platform and their privilege to do good in the world. Um, that was high impact athletes. Uh, I had the idea in June, 2020 had a very steep learning curve of, of how to start an organization, spoke to a bunch of people, um, launched it December, 2020. And hmm. it very quickly grew from, I thought it would just be me pestering my friends to, to donate to these charities that I knew were exceptional but it very quickly grew to something beyond that. And at this point we have over 120 athletes across 30 something different sports and around 30 different countries. Um, it's a, it's a really cool growing community and the amount of impact we're making in the real world is, it gets me super excited when I see the numbers that, mm. that are stacking up. Uh, and yeah, it, it has, it's been the thing that has kept me sane while I haven't been able to walk and you know, like, and, and, the guy who's now managing director of HIA 
he's uh, he's a field hockey player and and was one of the early pledges in HIA. He has this beautiful phrase, which is, if you commit a percentage of your income to something like the charities through HIA, it's like win or lose, you know you're making a difference. So mm. it's this constant, deeper meaning to mm. a sporting career or to a life. And uh, yeah, I think that's the thing that draws athletes in. That and also the fact that they can look at all of the evidence behind what their dollars are doing and see mm -hmm. the staggering amount of real world impact it can have. It's sort of like this idea of, you know, as athletes, we optimize every hour of our day when we're training to get the most improvement out of each hour. Mm -hmm. We should bring that same approach to the, to the charity space. And that's what these, mm -hmm. these organizations do. They try to optimize giving. Um, Right. So yeah, that was that was a, a long winded answer, but that's what high impact athletes is, and and that's um, that's what I've been spending the majority of my energy on uh, since February. Yeah. Now, so with high impact athletes, I mean, you talk when you when you talk about it, you you really always touch upon putting your money to work and your resources to work with the right organizations, quote unquote. And um, with with so many organizations out there, some of them you know always kind of asking and grasping for for our you know, our money and our resources, the way you always explain it and how high impact athletes work is that it's backed by research first so that you know that your resources are being maximized. How does that work? Yeah, so I think I'd be a little careful in calling them right and wrong charities. Um, I think mm -hmm. what's right for each individual to donate to is, is personal. Um, mm -hmm. What I'd say is that they are almost definitely the most cost effective charities. So mm. if you have a thousand dollars that you want to give to a charity, then with the charities that high impact athletes features, you can very likely do hundreds of times the amount of good than with an average charity. Mm. And that's the thing that I think it's really important for people to know is that there exist in the world opportunities to do hundreds of times the amount of good for the same amount of money, just depending on where you donate and, and to which charity you donate. So these research organizations, they uh, the gold standard on the human side is an organization called Give Well. Excuse me. And they, they were started, I think, around 15 or 16 years ago by two Bridgewater Associates hedge fund analysts who wanted to give away a large por portion of their salaries and started calling different charities saying, hey, we want to give you X hundred thousand dollars per year. Can you tell us what you're going to do with it? And just got extremely frustrated by the answers. Like mm -hmm. they, you know, they're used to in the hedge fund world, evaluating businesses to the nth degree being incredibly granular and looking at the five year, 10 year, 30 year plan. And when they didn't get any of that sort of information or transparency from the charities, they got really frustrated because it's like, how can I give my money to a place where I don't know how it's going to be spent? So they started this research organization that spends all of their time researching the most cost effective charities in the world. They spend over 20,000 research hours per year, like expert research hours per year wow. answering that question. And to give you an example of how stringent they are, uh, in their in the entirety of their existence, they've evaluated many thousands of charities. They've only ever highly recommended nine. So mm -hmm. what that means is that if you donate to one of those charities, you can be as confident as you can possibly be in the charity space that your dollar is doing the maximum amount of good. Um, and we work with those types of research organizations across our three cause areas, which are global health and poverty, uh, animal welfare and climate change. Um, so mm. the idea is that uh, the research that backs these charities, the reason why we feature them on HIA, that's all publicly available and continually being updated because it's not saying we know exactly what the answer is and that's the answer in perpetuity. It's we take as much data and research and evidence as we can and we continually update our thinking. So. That's what I really appreciate about this movement, this effective altruism movement, is it's always trying to find the best answer of how can I do the most good in the world? And we're trying to just make that more accessible to, to more people. Mm. Right. So effective altruism, that's been um, quite an inspirational point in your, um, 
in your journey. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so I <clears throat> I first discovered it in 2014. So so the year that I started merging more towards doubles and I started feeling like, okay, I can actually make a living from tennis, I started being able to save a little bit in, in my bank account. And at that point, <clears throat> it, was, I, I, it was like the first time that I felt I actually had the ability to give back. And mm. this was a real watershed moment for me because you'd understand even in team sports, but particularly in tennis, it's extremely selfish. It's, it's very self-centered sport in general is self-centered and it has to be because we're competing like in tennis, it's a zero sum game for me to win and progress. The opponent has to lose. So it's always pushing yourself ahead of people. And in teams, I think it's maybe less so, but you're still pushing yourself ahead of people into the starting lineup, you know? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I'm a competitive person, so I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the competition, but it also never sat perfectly with me. The person who I felt I had to be on court was not perfectly aligned with the person I wanted to be off court. So when I had this ability to give back, I really jumped on it. And I, like a good millennial, I, I sort of typed into Google, like how to give back best or something like that. And... I came across 80,000 Hours, which is a, an organization within the effective altruism movement. Their idea is career advice on, on how you can do the most good with your career. And I just loved it. It was such a light bulb moment for me. And, um, and so I just devoured all of the content on their website, which is extensive. I mean, even more so now, it's, it's a huge treasure trove of information. And I made my first donation that year um, and made my first 1% pledge the following year to 1% of my earnings to the most effective organizations in the world and just started building it up from there. So I've been personally involved since 2014 and it's been a huge addition to my life and hmm. high impact athletes is hopefully just a, a multiplier effect of, of that. Yeah. Right now, when you say, you know, one thing I like about like tithing or, or um, giving or giving back is that it's relative to your income, right? And what I'm hearing through HIA is, you know, maybe a lot of times people think, well, maybe I don't make enough to give back just yet. Like, let me make that part first and then I can give back. But it's, it's sounding like it's relative to what you can offer because these organizations that you are working with maybe don't need the maximum amount of pledge they can they can work with you know a little bit multiplied by a lot is you know can go a, a long way so talk to people that think that maybe our, our athletes that are starting like, like like we were at a young age but also want to get involved too and use their platform that they do have even if they're not making a lot monetarily um what would that look like for someone that you know doesn't have that much to give well that's the, that's the really beautiful thing there, there are two points here one is because these charities are so cost effective even small amounts can have a life changing impact in, in the poorest parts of the world. So, you know, like $10 can, can protect four people from malaria for up to five years. I mean, that's, that's a truly life changing impact for those people. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, t it's 10 bucks. It's what, even like one big coffee these days, two, two coffees. <laughs> um, if you're from New York, it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so that's the first thing. The first thing is that I think when, when we're confronted with these huge global problems, it's really easy to feel overwhelmed and think, you know, I'm not Bezos or Gates. I can't do anything about it. But mm -hmm. because these charities are so cost effective as individuals, we can actually do huge amounts of good in the world with small amounts, you know, what to us is small amounts of, of money. And then the other point is, you're absolutely right that a percentage scales with, with how much money you're making. And mm -hmm. so there's, there's one guy who's pledged with us and, and a pledge with HIA is, is 2% or more of earnings. And this is a guy who's on scholarship to a college in the States to play tennis. And he's mm -hmm. pledged 2% of his scholarship, which is a, a very small amount that he gets given per month to live off. And I think that is so beautiful. You know, this, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a living wage, but he's still pledging 2% of it. And in dollar value, it's really small. But mm 
mm. you know, the, the meaning of the commitment to me is even bigger than someone who's pledging 2% and earning a ton of money. I mean, wow. you, the people that, that I look up to, like someone who's had a huge impact on my life is Peter Singer, one of the sort of forefathers of the effect of altruism philosophy. And he, he, I think would make a significant amount of money per year. For example, recently he won a prize called the Bergeron Prize and he got $1 million in prize money and he donated every cent of it. And mm. he, half of it, he put out to the effective altruism community saying, where should I donate this? What, what are the best options right now? Wow. And those I think are beautiful because he, he's figured out how much he needs to live off and be happy and content and comfortable. Mm -hmm. And everything above that, he donates. I think that's just absolutely exceptional. Um, mm. So yeah, sorry, I, I got a bit off track there. But you're absolutely right that a percentage scales with the amount of money that you're earning. So even mm. like for tennis, you never know if you're going to have a good year or a bad year. But if you have a bad year, mm. you, you donate less. If you have a good year, you donate more. And for me, that was amazing. It was it was part of the the joy of having made that pledge because it meant that the better that I did in my career the more good I did in the world. And that's pretty cool when you're, when you're playing for something so much bigger than yourself. Completely. And, and, I, and I'm glad that you gave us that. It's, it's almost, it's almost a guilt trip sometimes when you think about um, what we're bombarded with. Cause like you said, as a good millennial, we go on Google and it's like, give here, give here. Everyone's kind of grabbing for your attention. And then we get the sad puppy on TV and Sarah McLaughlin starts singing, you know, and then we, <laughs> <laughs> we get like teary and it's like ah, and then you just kind of change the channel over as quick as you can um and you know obviously with our the, the amount of conversations we've had it's i know that that's not the case through hia and, and, and through these things but you've also given a great example one time about how far money can actually go um in regards to uh i think it was like curing blindness and then also um uh for uh guiding eyes for the blind or, or one of those other um uh, organizations can you can you give us that example again just to give the perspective to our listeners yeah for sure so so you're so right and and this is one of the catch 22 so the biggest charities in the world the ones that are the most well funded those are the advertisements you'll see because they spend millions mm -hmm. on marketing mm -hmm. and the charities that we feature on HIA if they had millions of excess dollars they'd want to save thousands of lives with that money rather than make an advertisement. But that's also the chicken egg situation because, mm. you know, by spending on marketing, these big charities are probably getting more people to donate to them, which can have this, you know, this sort of roll on effect. But, mm. you know, that, that puppy example, you see puppies on TV and, and you want to help them. Uh, and, you know, I love dogs. Like we, we rescued Loki from, from the SPCA a few months ago. Like, you know, mm. both my wife and I are, are, a little bit creepily in love with dogs. Um, but this example is in the States, it can cost around $50,000 to train a seeing eye dog and also the human because you, the dogs have to be exceptionally well trained, but the human also has to be trained to, to work with the dog. So it's a long mm. process uh, and it's a beautiful thing. Like uh, I'm, I'm not debating that at all. I think it's a beautiful thing. However, when you're confronted with the realities of the options that you have, so so $50,000 to train one dog to help one person navigate the world for, if we're being generous with the, the length of a dog's life, let's say 15 years. If you were to donate the same amount of money to an organization like Helen Keller International, you'd be able to help prevent early onset blindness in over 37,000 children. So... Wow. For the same amount of money, on one side, you're helping one human and a dog for 15 years. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, you're vastly improving the lives of over 37,000 children in, in the poorest parts mm -hmm. of the world. Now, for me, when I, when I see those options, for me, it's an absolute no-brainer where I would donate that money. Mm. But I think not enough people understand that these these differences in, in cost effectiveness exist. So part of mm. HIA's mission is to make the, make the world more aware that these opportunities exist for people 
and it's simply a matter of redirecting donations. Um, mm. And yeah, so for me, that's that's sort of the no-brainer, and that's the impact that that donating to the most cost-effective places can have in comparison to what's considered like a, a normal charity. Yeah, and it's building that that trust again too, because I mean, if I'm if I'm being honest, there was there's you know and like you said there's no good or bad really charities you know everyone's doing their best you could say but there's also been a, a, a breach of trust with some of the organizations where hey mate like a news comes out that my money didn't go where it said it was going to be going or, or just a small percentage did um and it sounds like with hia it's it, it's not only creating the awareness around hey you could you could really impact more with the same dollar amount um, but it's also creating that trust bridge that you need to get people on board. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the biggest hurdle that everyone has when they're thinking about donating to charity is how do I know? And and the wow. the ugly truth is that most charities are extremely opaque about how funds are used, and that's not mm. the way it should be. Not when you're giving your money away. I mean, if you're investing money, you expect to know exactly what that company is doing. But wow. with charity, it's um, for whatever reason it, it hasn't developed that way, and I think it's wrong. And that's why I, that's why I, mm. I am so excited about this area that we're working in, and why I I try to push this so hard because these research organisations, mm. their absolute baseline to recommend a charity is full transparency. Because if you don't have full transparency, mm. how can you recommend anything? Um, right. So the the the, the baseline of trust is at the very least you'll know what's happening with your dollars and you know uh, I think at, at its core that's really what we're doing is, is we're providing a trusted place for athletes in particular but also hopefully mm -hmm. for a much wider audience to be able to donate and feel confident and feel good about what their dollars are doing yeah now what I, re I really like to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of uh, of how an organization comes to be because a lot of our listeners are are were in the same boat and they maybe they were athletes or maybe they were in another career and they 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 saw a moment to transition and when when I when we do interviews it can kind of seem very seamless right like it's just you were a tennis player HIA became what it is and now you know everyone's rosy but you st when we spoke before um what i want to ask you is like who who did you what who and what did you leverage um to learn about creating an organization because it's not something that we just learn uh it's not something that we know off the top of our head so who was it for you that you that you leaned on um to for for help and for guidance yeah so absolutely like it it, it was a lot of work um <laughs> And the two things I leaned on most heavily, one was the internet. Uh, I think it's incredible the amount that you can learn from the internet these days. I mean, you know, like I, I learned how to build a website. One thing that was terrible at the time, but might've been quite lucky was I actually, after, so after going over to the States to be with my wife in 2020, um, we got engaged and then the next day uh, the US government sent me an email saying get out of the country within 10 days because I was on a <laughs> I was on a on one of those Esther visas like a 90 day thing and I'd, I'd yeah. completely forgotten about it so um, it was a mad scramble to try to get my fiance at the time permission to come into New Zealand because she's American and uh, mm. you know borders were closed to non-citizens so anyway like 12 hours before my i booked the last possible flight i could get out of the states 12 hours before the flight this exemption comes through we managed to get her on the flight get to new zealand we've got to do two weeks in a hotel room of isolation so hmm. that was actually possibly a blessing in disguise because i had absolutely nothing i could do so i spent those two weeks just cramming my brain with as, as many bits of knowledge as I could around how to build an organization, sort of started building the website then. The other thing, so the internet is one, um, YouTube videos, whatever it is. 
uh, and then the other thing that I've been incredibly lucky with is the effect of altruism community has just been so generous with their time. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I've reached out to many dozens of executive directors or founders of other organizations within the movement, just saying, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. This is my vision. I really want to make it a reality. Can mm. you tell me what mistakes you made so that I can try to avoid them? And people were just unbelievably generous with their time and honesty. And I feel very indebted to the community. And one thing I'm trying to do now is, you know, High Impact Athletes is still very young, but it's, mm -hmm. it's moved quickly. And I have had some people approach me saying, saying, you know, can, can you tell me how you did it or can you give me some advice? And so one thing I'm trying to do is sort of pay it forward a bit and give whoever asks me of my time, the time that I was given by people who were so much further along in the journey than me. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, those two things. I mean, I, I think a really important quality in my mind is being extremely humble and asking stupid questions and not caring if you look stupid because like, I, I just care about learning and about doing a good job. So, you know, mm -hmm. if, if someone thinks that I'm not smart for not getting a, a concept immediately and I have to ask a couple of questions to grasp it, that's, I don't see that as a negative, but that's, that's just part of the, part of the process. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd say those, those two things and also probably, you know, a, a family, like my father is very entrepreneurial as a mindset. I mean, he's, a, he's a farmer, mm -hmm. but he sort of approaches it from a, an uncommon place in in the farming world and and yeah so i think we we also grew up just with with that sort of mindset too yeah so just to reframe that for anyone listening because it, this is giving people such great framework is one do your own research like there's there's no excuse as to what we have at our disposal these days uh the second thing is don't be afraid to be look stupid like remember when you first tried to hit a tennis ball i'm sure it wasn't great um and to and to be humble enough to come back and say okay let me try this again and, and again and kind of get beat down and just have that shameless audacity to ask like um you'll be surprised who will come to your aid you know um and to be honest the for me you know you jumping on this podcast for me is is that is you know you're doing what you what you were so grateful for in regards to these other executives um so you're obviously paying it forward so i thank you for that and then the third is you know support team right like you have a tremendous family that you can lean on and bounce ideas off of and they'll you know people around you that will say you know there's feedback and it's not always like oh great job keep doing what you're doing sometimes you need that honest honest feedback as well but those are three really amazing um key points to to note for anyone that wants to create their next chapter it's 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 not it, it's not hard it's very hard but it's a great kind of tracks for them to run on yeah th another thing that just popped up for me there is i think sport creates that audacity like sport mm. is just the process of failing and failing and failing and just trying <laughs> you know like you have to be comfortable with failing and learning from it and and trying again mm. and trying harder and picking yourself back up and <clears throat> i do see a lot of parallels between sport and business i mean you know the high impact athletes is a non-profit but it's it's a business just without the profit um mm -hmm. and there are a lot of failures the same way that in tennis you know almost every week of the year i would lose like people people don't win many tournaments per year wow. and if you don't win a tournament you've lost that week uh you know mm -hmm. I, I mean the example is if there are if there are 64 people in a, in a draw then 63 people lose you know um so i think uh, the point i'm trying to make is i think one thing that sport is really good for is creating that resilience and that ability mm -hmm. to take failure and learn from it and try again and yeah that's that's probably been the most valuable mindset for me in this mm. now the name high impact I think if you were to ask somebody, like, do you want to make an impact? They'd be like, yeah, like, let's do it. Like, how do we? So what is impact? When you, when you think of that word, what, what does that mean to you? To me, it's, it's optimization. 
It's mm. it's getting the most out of whatever you can put towards something, and I try to bring that approach to every aspect of my life. You know, like I, I try to do the exercise that I know will have the biggest impact on my health. I try to read the books mm. that I feel will expand my mind the most. Um, I try to donate to the charities that I think will reduce the most suffering in the world. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I love that mindset. And when I think high impact, that's, that's what I think. The other thing I learned post fact was HIA is, uh, in any contact sport, the term for head injury assessment. So that's, uh, when, <laughs> that's, when, that's when people get con concussed and have to go off field and, and get an examination. So that's not, that's not the best, but, um, hopefully we can give it a, uh, a more positive meaning. Yeah, hopefully so. Or just don't recruit those people. You know, they like, take all my money. Uh, no, that's great, mate. So, uh, you know, for for you, obviously, you know, when we we spoke months ago, um, obviously because you got injured and you, and you really needed to rest and you couldn't even put your you know straighten your leg out. Um, a lot has happened since we last spoke. So, now I'd love to know, like, what are you most excited about? Um, for the future, you know, in regards to the game, personally, you know, in your own career, in the game in itself, um, and and business, and you know, your personal life. What what's keeping you going? Yeah, so on on the tennis front, I'm just I'm keen to get healthy. Like I'm keen to get mm -hmm. my knee back to normal and step on a tennis court and see what it feels like. Um, I find it hard to even think about tennis when I can't walk walk downstairs. You know. Um, and knowing how much stress tennis puts on a body, I just can't imagine being on a tennis court right now. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's on pause a little bit while I rehab. Mm -hmm. um, on the high impact athletes front, I'm really excited that we've, we've got our first our first athletes in in all of the major U.S. team sports. So NBA, NFL. NHL and MLB. Yeah, we've we've got um, our first athletes in all of those sports over the last few months, wow. um, which is awesome because mm -hmm. I need to con congratulate you because the the states is the the most mm -hmm. generous country in the world per capita, and those uh, those big team sports are insanely well funded and the mm -hmm. salaries are super high. So trying to push into that area, I think could could create a lot of change in the world. And on a personal front, I think, yeah, so so much of my energy at the moment is tied up with trying to get healthy again. So I mm -hmm. think physical health is, is the biggest thing on my mind. Um, and also just embracing this time off that I'm in New Zealand. You know, I've, I've, I've been able to spend very, very little time in New Zealand over the last 15 years. And it's mm -hmm. a place I feel extremely deep connections to. So just trying to soak it all in while I'm here and, and enjoy the nature and, and the water and the colors. Um, yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Now, if we want to get in touch, what, what's the best way for us to, to learn more about HIA to, to follow you, um, you know, your personal and your professional account? Yeah. So high impact athletes is, is on all the socials. Uh, if you search, mm -hmm. it's either high impact athletes or HIA org, I think on the socials, mm -hmm. um, would really appreciate follows. I feel like part of, um, part of being able to, to approach athletes that I don't have a personal connection to something that really helps is credibility. And unfortunately credibility on social media is largely based on how many people follow you. Um, right. so, you know, just by following our accounts, you could help to reach the next big athlete, which could have actually a, a pretty sizable impact on the world. If they pledge to donate 2% of their income or if they convince 1% of their audience to, mm. to start donating to the most cost effective places. So that's one easy action that people can take to, to really help us out. And then personally, um, I'm Marcus Daniel across the socials. I'm pretty useless at it really. Um, I'm trying to be better cause it's, it's sort of, uh, yeah, I, I, there might be a relationship between, you know, how, how much of a following I have and how much good I can do for high impact athletes, the movement. Um, mm. but yeah, that's how you can stay in touch and, and please do keep an eye out for us. And, and if you know any athletes who 
might be interested in chatting about what we do, then please send them my way through the website, which is highimpactathletes.org. Awesome. Perfect. Marcus, fit time to try, and I think we nailed it. I think that was it. <laughs> no, we just got to see what happens in the, when, I, when I hit stop. But uh, joking aside, mate, thanks, thanks for your patience. Um, thank you for being a wealth of knowledge as well. I've learned so much just from, from, from speaking with you. Um, and and watching you light up when you talk about the giving back and, and high-impact athletes in your journey so far. So um, it's been a breath of fresh air to know that there's really people out here that want to make an impact. And uh, I just want to thank you again for taking the time, and, and I wish you all the best in your recovery. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks for having me on for the fifth time. Hopefully <laughs> hopefully we get one good take out of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, if look, not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to... <laughs> I'm gonna fly down. I'm flying down to New Zealand. We're gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've I've enjoyed these chats. Um, and and yeah, I I I like what you're doing. So pl- please do keep it up. Cool man. All right. Speak soon. Cheers. Cheers.